Um, my name is Tom Mason. I'm the executive director of the US Japan Bridging Foundation. And it's really exciting to be here tonight because we're going to talk about careers and in international education. So Paul and Sayori, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Indeed and Recruit Holdings. I like to begin these sessions by introducing Indeed and Recruit. So let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll talk to you a little bit about these two organizations that are responsible for making this webinar series happen over the last year. So Indeed is owned by Recruit Holdings and you may not know it, but Recruit is actually one of the largest companies in Japan. They're an HR company that helps individuals find jobs in the United States and then with uh, in Japan and then with Indeed in the United States and around the world. Indeed was founded in 2004 in the US and they also have um, uh, headquarters in Austin and Stamford. Indeed's mission is we help people get jobs. Indeed was acquired by Recruit Holdings um, and they now have more than 100 billion market cap. So it's a really good example of US Japan bridging in terms of business. Let's just take a look at their website. I'm sure most people are familiar with the website. You can enter in your keyword here. And when I did this earlier, I found a really neat Japanese language teaching job that you can pull up here. Um, if you put in your job term, uh, positions will come up. You can add in a keyword search. If you're looking for positions in Japan, you can look into their Japanese website, jp.indeed.com. You can put in your keyword and then your prefecture where you'd like to work. One of the most interesting components of the website, I think, is their career guide. Take a look at this, and you can find some interesting uh, blog articles and other ways that'll help you in your career search, such as the virtual interview guide here. I usually recommend this to students that I'm working with. The other component that you might find interesting is the easy and free online resume builder that'll help you develop your resume, and then you can submit it to the site. So I'd like to thank Indeed for all of their sponsorship this year. We were able to do 12 webinars since fall 2021. They're all available on our website. You can go to the webinar um, recordings on YouTube. So a big shout out to them. I'd like to get started with the webinar and introduce Sayuri Rome. Sayuri is Associate Director of Programs at the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. And, I, sure, uh, sure. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. No, just wanted to say good evening, everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, thanks, Tom, for inviting me. And it's really so nice to, to share the, the, the floor with, with Paul tonight. Stop. Fantastic. And we are so excited too, Sayuri. Uh, and also with us tonight is Paul Champalou. Um, he is Senior Director, Exchange Visitor, and Grant Programs at Cultura Vistas. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Tom, and good evening and good morning to everybody who's out there and listening to us today. Great. Um, so during today's conversation, which will last for about 40, 45 minutes, um, if people have questions or comments, feel free to drop your comments in the chat and your questions, if you would use the Q&A box, that would um, be very helpful for us. So Sayuri um, and Paul, um, maybe we can begin by asking you to do just a brief self-introduction and um, describing you know, a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing now so we can put this into context. Sayuri, do you wanna begin? Yes, of course. So, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Sayuri. Um, I work at uh, the Mansfield Foundation. Um, the Mansfield Foundation is, is a nonprofit and um, we, we try to we, we promote uh, understanding and cooperation between the US and Asia. And um, we especially like working on trilateral relationships. So for example, uh, two of the programs I'm responsible for are um, a U.S., Japan, China, Trilat um, dialogue on climate change and energy, 
and um, a US-Japan, South Korea dialogue on nuclear spent fuel management. So, so we, we like this kind of cooperation uh, in exchange dialogues. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I have a background in research, but uh, right now at the Mansfield Foundation, I'm, I'm mostly doing uh, conceptualizing programs and, and a lot of programming work uh, for US, Asia, and especially Japan. Thanks, Sayuri. We can't wait to hear more. There's a lot to dig into here. Um, Paul, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Paul Champlou, Senior Director at Cultural Vistas. Uh, Cultural Vistas is a nonprofit that's existed since the 1960s. We do a number of academic and exchange programs that um, in normal non-pandemic years usually total about 3,000 to 3,500 participant exchanges. Uh, I work specifically um, in overseeing federal grant programs for the exchange visitor and grants department at Cultural Vistas. Um, at any given moment, uh, year to year, I oversee about 13 to 16 different grant programs. We have some uh, large grants uh, that we work with US Department of State uh, on as, as collaborators and partners, including the International Visitor Leadership Program. It's one of US Department of State's uh, premier exchange programs that have existed since the 1940s. Um, we, I also am overseeing the Edmund S. Muskie Professional Fellowship Program that works with uh, Fulbrighters that are coming from former Soviet countries um, that are seeking professional experience here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I also do another uh, a number of smaller grant programs with U.S. embassies, um, including U.S. Embassy Tokyo uh, as well, too. We have a, a, a couple of Tokyo alumni conferences that we're looking at putting together. Um, but that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of, of the types of programs I oversee and, and uh, work on at the same time. Excellent. Thank you. My understanding is that you both have a connection with Japan. Can you talk a little bit about how you got connected to Japan and, and where your interest stems from? So Yuri, we'll start with you again. Sure. Yeah, so for me, my connection with Japan is um, has started from the beginning. Uh, it started naturally from family. Uh, my mother is Japanese and my dad is Italian and I grew up in Rome in Italy. I, I, I grew up speaking Japanese. I went to Japanese school on Saturdays. Uh, so I grew up surrounded by Japanese culture, language, family, my own family in Japan. Uh, however, so, so that came naturally. Um, however, there was a distinct moment in my studies where I consciously made the decision to study Japan. Um, and, and that was a little different, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was when I wrote my second uh, undergrad um, thesis on Japan's uh, Meiji constitution that was in 2011. And that's really when I thought, you know what, learning about Japanese history, about Japanese politics is a lot of fun. And I'd love to continue learning about, about that and um, maybe, you know, specializing uh, in Japan studies. And so that's when I first detached my own personal bond with Japan and started thinking about uh, becoming a so-called expert in Japan. <laughs> so Excellent. yeah, that's my so, story. And did you end up um, going, where, where did you do your undergrad? Was it in, in Italy? Yes, that's right. So my, I, I did two undergrad degrees, actually. Okay. I, I've been in school for a long time. And <laughs> you have a PhD as well. <laughs> That's right. The first uh, degree, the first undergrad was in France, uh, in Paris at Sorbonne uh, University, uh, and I was a English literature major. Mm -hmm. And, and then I went back to Rome, where I grew up, and I did my second undergrad in political science and international relations in Rome, at the University of Rome. I after my undergrad uh, in France um, in, in um, English literature, I thought I, I love languages and I grew up with uh, speaking languages. I went to French school in Rome. And um, so I thought, you know, English or, uh, uh, languages are fun, but I want to 
combine my knowledge of language uh, languages with something else, some other knowledge. So I, I picked um, political science and uh, that's how I started uh, being more and more interested in, in politics, uh, international politics. Fantastic. Well, great. Um, and we'll continue along that line of conversation, too. I'm interested in how you ended up in the, in the U.S. at the Mansfield Foundation. Um, Paul, how about you? Where did you get your start in Japanese? Yeah, it, it was definitely a bit more indirect. Um, like Sayuri, I have a very heavy European background, um, as my name probably implies to many of you. But um, I did a lot of studies in France as well, too, and just about European history. Um, my degrees are in French studies and French cultural studies specifically. Okay. Um, my interest with Japan started, I would say, uh, probably college. Um, uh, it did end up starting with manga and anime. Um, as I was studying abroad in France, I remember catching on to uh, the, um, the artwork, um, because French, uh, in France, manga is extremely popular. And mm -hmm. so I started reading up kind of catching glimpses of Japanese culture. And so that started putting, uh, a bit of a seed in my mind to, at some point in the future, go and, and explore and visit Japan. Um, I was at that point looking at joining the foreign service possibly. So, uh, at the same time, when I was finishing my studies in Europe, I was thinking to myself, what would help me sort of orient myself onto this track? And I figured I need to expand my perspectives, right? Uh, up until that moment, I was only focusing on France and Europe. Um, and I was thinking, well, to, to go into foreign service, I need to have a, a larger knowledge base. And so where was some place that um, was very different from Europe that I can help garner more knowledge um, about international relations and, and international experiences. Um, and so I started looking towards Japan at the same time that I was doing my studies in Europe. Um, I did have a friend from college who uh, ended up doing the Japan exchange and teaching program at the same time, ended up telling me lots of great things about the JET program. Um, and so after finishing my studies, I ended up applying and getting in um, and stayed in Japan for three years afterward. And that really just exploded mm -hmm. my interest um, in Japan from, from that point on. Right. As an aside, where were you in Japan? I was in Minabecho in the wonderful prefecture of Wakayama which Wakayama. is to the south of Osaka. Okay. Fantastic, right, right, great, great. And so um, talk about language study for, for just a moment, for your own study. Did you do um, Japanese language at your university? I did one semester in college. Okay. My very yeah. last semester uh, of college is when I did that. Mm -hmm. um, I did do the JET program two years later after okay. that. Right. So it was extremely rusty. And, and a lot of the Japanese I picked up was actually on the spot in Japan. Um, right. okay. Because I, I am fluent in French, um, right. it, I think it was a bit easier for me to pick up because I just applied the same learning mechanisms exactly. of right. learning French to Japanese. Right, right, exactly. And, and Sayuri, how about, how about you? You um, grew up speaking the language? Yes, that's correct. Um, my, the first language I started speaking was Japanese, actually. Okay. And um, my, I, I was born in the south of Italy, right. where my, my dad is from, uh, but my mom uh, coming from Japan, um, she was really adamant that I um, study Japanese uh, and that mm -hmm. I grew up speaking uh, a different language. Um, and that's why uh, we, we moved to, to Rome when I was two and, and because there are more opportunities there. Uh, in the capital, in the capital right. city. So um, yeah, I, they sent me to French school uh, when I was um, in kindergarten. Okay. But before that, they sent me to Japanese yotien, uh, okay. kindergarten mm -hmm. in, in Rome. So I remember vaguely, but I still remember <laughs> uh, my, my, my first words and my first language really was Japanese. And then 
um, and, and then, you know, my, my parents were um, told me how uh, they, it was challenging because as a kid, you pick up the language uh, that your environment uh, speaks. So my kindergarten in, in Japanese. So I was fluent in, in Japanese as a toddler, but then um, I had no knowledge or I was refusing to speak in Italian, but I was living in, Ita in Italy. Right. So that was a problem. So they, they told me about all the, the, the efforts that they made so that I could speak different language languages at the same time. And they sent me to French school in, in kindergarten later. So um, yeah, I, I grew up speaking French, Italian and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And um, at first, you know, maybe as a teenager, it's, um, it's sometimes it's a lot because um, Japanese school is on Saturdays, right? And you have uh, kanji kanji no testo uh, kanji test every week. It was it was really uh, a lot, uh, but uh, now I feel so grateful actually <laughs> that I learned Japanese yeah. as, a, as a kid because it, it's a it's it's a very difficult language, of course, right? As right. everyone knows, so. It's it's really hard to to pick up, but also hard to um, to keep up. Uh, so um, yeah, so I, I I feel I feel very lucky now. I, I see the fruits the fruit of, of, of these efforts now. But as a as a as a kid, I was not really sure. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear you say this because um, I have a bilingual family as well. We're raising my wife is Chinese, and we're raising my children to speak English and Chinese. And uh, it's a struggle to keep, the, of course, their English they keep up at school, but to keep their Chinese up is really hard. It's really hard for me as a non-native Chinese speaker to speak Chinese continuously at home. Um, it's also really good for my Chinese. And the, the kids struggle, but uh, we are determined that they will grow up bilingual because we know the rewards um, once you get out into the adulthood and you start working and, and engaging on a global scale. So great to hear, great to hear. So you're both in uh, international education at the moment, and I'm really interested in hearing the road that you took to get there. So maybe we can start by, um, maybe we'll go back to Paul. And can you talk a little bit about what you did after the, the JET program um, and, and how you ended up in the seat that you're in now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after the JET program, I came back to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, my family um, has been living in the area in Maryland specifically for a few decades now. Okay. Uh, so I ended up coming back. Um, I do know that something that was extremely important in terms of helping me with my professional development was connecting with the alumni community, mm -hmm. specifically the JET alumni community. Um, okay. I also was going to different events that my uh, alma maters, uh, my schools were, were putting on as well too, mm -hmm. uh, just to try to, to expand my, my networking options. But I would really say that it was the JET Alumni Association that really put me in touch with people who um, I was able to set up informational sessions and kind of mm -hmm. find out um, sort of, I, I knew what I wanted to go into, but I didn't know what was available in terms of jobs, the organizations. And so being able to meet with other JET alumni who had established themselves in, in various roles, um, including one JET alumni who is at State Department and talked to me about the International Visitor Leadership Program that I now oversee at Cultural Vistas. Uh, that was the first time I ever heard of such a program. Um, was very interested in, in you know, continuing uh, that aspect of people-to-people -people exchange that I got a, a real taste of in Japan on the JET program and wanted to continue onward. And so I was able to orient my, my search for a job in that direction. Um, I didn't originally start off in the IVLP team. Um, okay. I started off actually uh, working in the J-1 visa processing team. Um, and that sort of door into Cultural Vistas uh, also came about because of the, the connections to 
uh, JET and the JET program office. I actually, when I first came back, did temp work with the Embassy of Japan's JET office um, to grade and, and review applications. Uh, and so that, I feel, gave me a lot of concrete skill sets that I was able to apply to processing visas, get an idea of sort of what, what's happening on the back end of these international exchanges that we do. Um, and then I was able to sort of um, use that to propel myself to that next position up. Um, from when I entered, I was able to uh, uh, go for an internal opportunity as a program officer with the IVLP team. And from there, um, I was using not only that background in visa processing um, and visa requirements, but also I was able to pull in some of those previous experiences I had in Japan, for example, um, experiences that I didn't know at that moment would help me kind of jump into that next level. Um, and then from program officer to director, um, it was another moment where, um, you know, a opportunity arose um, and, and I went after it too within the organization and uh, was, was lucky enough to get selected. Um, but again, it was using all those previous skill sets that I had gained um, over the, the previous years and just kind of, um, you know, making sure that it showed that I was able to fulfill those responsibilities as, you know, now a director. Right. It's uh, fascinating that you've been with the same organization for nine years, 10 years. That's a, that's a really uh, unusual um, career path and, and, and congratulations too, that, that you've been there for that long. Um, me as well, I was with the Alex Foundation for I think 20 years before I came to Bridging. Um, I also did J-1 visa processing, which I highly recommend for uh, anyone that's on the call that's interested in international education. The, the whole J-1 program is fascinating. Uh, so, so check it out. Of course, Cultural Vistas is the leader in the field there. Yeah. Sayuri, um, can you tell us a little bit about your travel? You went to, you did your um, undergraduate in France, and then you did another one um, in, in Italy. Uh, what was your path after that? Yeah, sure. Um, so unlike Paul. Um, uh, Sayur, yeah. can I just interrupt just for a moment? There's a couple of international students on the call today, too. And um, it may be interesting for them to uh, listen to this next uh, to Sayuri's comments with the understanding that Sayuri um, uh, came to United States uh, and, and then, uh, you know, sought employment in the United States as an, as an international visitor. So her pathway is uh, relevant to perhaps the careers that some of you are looking at. So you yeah. must answer. No, not at all. Thank you. Thanks for, for adding this question. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, I was in school uh, for, for, for quite some time. And unlike in the United States, um, European, Europe, sorry, Europeans, uh, they usually go straight from undergrad to a master's mm -hmm. and maybe to a PhD. Sure. So that's what I did. Um, after, uh, you know, after my second undergrad, uh, I, to be honest, I like studying, so. <laughs> yep, <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to if you did a PhD. Right, so after after that, um, I, I, I did my master's uh, okay. because I was really uh, getting very interested in international politics and I was really refining my focus, uh, my, my research interest. And during my master's, that's why, uh, that's when I met uh, my, uh, PhD advisor. Um, okay. He is uh, a professor at the University of Roma 3 uh, in Rome. Uh, he's a historian. He's a nuclear historian. And that's how my, my nuclear policy uh, career and interest started there. And um, after my master's thesis, um, which was after completing that, which was on US extended nuclear deterrence to Japan, so the nuclear umbrella to Japan, I decided to, continuing, uh, to continue researching uh, the, the topic because I had found this uh, exceptional mentor. Um, so I think his 
figure as a mentor was really, really essential uh, for my for my path. And he was uh, able to, to guide me through this uh, uh, difficult uh, PhD journey. Uh, PhD in, in Europe, it's usually three or four years. Uh, mine was four years. And um, yeah, it, it, it was very, very tough. Um, my PhD dissertation was an analysis of Japan's nuclear hedging posture. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, so basically it's the position, the political position that the Japanese government um, uses uh, to say we, we could uh, develop nuclear weapons, but we don't. Uh, okay. so, so that's the, sure. the, the topic. And uh, I spent my last year of my PhD as a fellow, um, as a pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. Okay. Yeah, and um, and then after that, I moved to DC um, for for personal reasons, actually, because uh, my now husband was um, has has been living here for for a long time. So um, when I was completing my PhD, I found a, a job um, at the, the Sasaka Peace Foundation USA yes. here in DC okay. as a fellow for security and foreign affairs. Um, and yeah, I've been lucky to stay in the field of US-Japan relations, security and foreign affairs since finishing my studies basically. But unlike Paul, I, I've been bouncing around uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit actually. And um, for your second part of your question about um, you know being seeking uh, employment here uh, as, as a foreigner, uh, yeah, it, it is quite tough uh, to be to be completely honest. And uh, many of the opportunities are are closed, were closed. Actually, uh, I, I want to disclose that I am a citizen now, mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it, it was uh, it, it was pretty, pretty tough uh, trying mm -hmm. to, to find a job. Um, for example, I, I'm still interested in, you know, government jobs or, sure. or other opportunities or other fellowships, and many of them were just for U.S. citizens. I see. So, yeah, even uh, research uh, positions. So I think uh, that's a, a little uh, complicated. It's definitely a hurdle, um, an extra step uh, for someone who comes from, um, from a different country. And also... One more thing uh, about this point is that my PhD is from uh, a European university, which is also hard to translate, to transfer right. Uh, right. here. Right. Um, here in, in the US, a PhD, as you all know, is five to six years, even more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very long uh, journey, and I think it's configured in a little bit of a different way. Um, so than, than a European PhD. So uh, I, I know that as a as someone who has a, a European PhD, mm -hmm. it's really hard to uh, make it in in the in academia in right. the US. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can talk more about this. Obviously, um, I'd love to hear more. Let, let's keep going. This is this is great. Um, there's a there's a question here, and if people have questions, if they want to um, dig a little bit deeper in something, feel free to drop something in the chat. There's a question here, are there any paths using linguistics or more language focused? I really enjoy studying Japanese and kanji and the history of it. Um, and I usually don't talk about myself on these sessions, but, um, but I will just briefly, where my background is in Japanese and Chinese. Um, I studied uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese in undergrad, masters, and then I did my PhD in Japanese pedagogy. And uh, so I'm an example. This person is asking about someone who did a path that's language focused. Um, I uh, took my background in language and language teaching and, and found an organization that builds language programs in the United States called the Alex Foundation. And uh, that foundation helps um, uh, universities strengthen their language programs. And then they train uh, graduate instructors to become 
Japanese, Chinese, and Korean professors in the United States. So I, there, I mean, that's just one example of someone who took a background in language and turned it into a career. Other people do things like um, translation or interpreting, or um, they go into teaching. There's a huge demand now for Japanese language um, professors at the K through 16 level. So there's a lot of opportunities um, at universities and of course, high schools, immersion programs, et cetera. The, a lot of folks who got into the uh, profession in the 1980s are now at retirement age. So if you're on the session and you're, you know, you're, you're starting your career, you're interested in Japanese, there, there are a lot of master's programs now available. Um, Middlebury just started one for uh, JET alum. I think that they have funding available. So do look into that. I'm interested to turning back to our guests. Um, what role uh, did did um, networking play in your job search? And and Paul, you alluded to this when you talked about um, the alumni communities. And I was wondering if you could share some strategies on how you networked. I, you know, when I started out um, networking upon graduation, networking was somewhat of a you know, to me, not being a networker uh, almost had a dirty image, right? Because networker was about using other people for my own benefit. Now, of course, that's not what it is, but it took a while for me to get over that. Um, so can you share a little bit about what networking means to you and how it helped you in your career? Sure, yeah. I, and I definitely understand what you're saying, because for, for many, it can be very hard. Um, at times, it feels superficial as well, too, mm -hmm. because you're just sort of cycling, trying to to see if you, you get basically a match um, right. for something right. you're interested right. in. Um, it, it is something that I am grateful for the Judd Alumni Association and mm -hmm. any alumni association you have beyond just that sort of superficial connection for looking for jobs, you do have a bit of a, a deeper connection that you can rely on. So for example, with uh, the JET program, everyone had a lot of shared experiences that you could relate to. And so it was easier to kind of go beyond just the, the superficial level of, you know, where one person feels like they're just being used for information from the other. Right. Um, and so the networking took on very much for me, uh, an aspect of friendship at the same time. And so mm -hmm. many people I networked with ended up becoming very good friends with as a result and still communicate to this day. And so that was something that I felt um, is very necessary, being able to establish that type of connection. So it, it doesn't feel um, like you said, dirty or, or superficial um, and just going through the motion sort of thing. Uh, being intentional is also uh, important. Um, you know, you uh, will learn different things from different people and then building upon those experiences can really help um, figure out which direction you want to go into. Um, and so, you know, uh, in my case, I was looking at, you know, international relations, uh, different types of jobs, whether it was nonprofit, private, uh, government as well, too. And so with each conversation I was having with people, um, I was able to sort of pinpoint more or less kind of where I really wanted to, to go and where I saw myself. Um, and if, for example, group networking isn't sort of your thing, if you do find somebody who is in an interesting position, um, feel free to just uh, reach out and do an informational session, a one-on-one -on -one where you can get more personalized time, um, sit down for coffee, uh, because now we can, I've, I've have seen more and more people doing the in-person connecting nowadays, at least yeah. here in, on the East coast, um, you know, over zoom is also fine too. just finding ways to communicate. Um, I've done a number of, of informational zoom sessions for, for people interested in, in my field or my organization as well. And that ended up working out pretty well. Um, and helps people stand out a little bit more too, because right. you do get that personalized attention. And mm -hmm. um, it shows that you're also being proactive too, right. um, in terms of reaching out and trying to really figure out um, what works for you and what doesn't work. This is really helpful, Paul. Thank you. Um, there's this book that I, um, 
I have it in the other room called uh, Give and Take by Adam Grant. He's a, uh, I think he's a professor at Wharton. Um, and uh, his take on networking is, it should be as much as, it, uh, as much about giving as it is about taking. So, you know, when I first started to network, I was thinking, well, geez, who can this person introduce me to? You know, how would this be beneficial to my career, right? I mean, that's what we think about when, at least that's what I thought about when I started to network. But it's really about what can I provide this person? And um, if you can provide anything, everyone can provide something. Maybe it's just a, just a, a, a an article related to their current work or, or an introduction or something. And then at some point down the line, maybe a six months later, a year later, they may come back and reach out to you. And networking is long term. It's not just, you know, something that happens over a couple of weeks, a month. So when you reach out to them, and I always, you know, whenever I finish a conversation where I'm getting to know someone, I always like to end, oh, thank you very much. And, and um, what can I do for you? Is there anything that I can I can provide? Maybe you don't have to answer that now, but does anything that I can do, let you do, you know, give me a call. And people are often just shocked. Is it? Oh, yeah, well, that's great. Thank you so much for asking. That's that's really kind. It's really give and take by Adam Grant is a super book. Sayuri, how about you? I'm interested in that transition from uh, Stanford to Sasakawa, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... You know, um, at um, at Stanford, I had a purely research position. So um, yeah, I, I I would consider it my first job because um, yeah, I, I, I was doing my PhD, but it was a a position at, right. at the university. Uh, I had a mentor. Uh, I was working on my on my research, but. It was really when I first, um, you know, started working in an office and uh, having colleagues where I could exchange um, views on, on different topics. And uh, it, it was, granted, it was a very particular kind of job because mm -hmm. a research job is, is is like that. Basically, you 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 all work together in an office, but each of us uh, works on a different uh, project. And then uh, we, we, we come together as a group for, um, you know, uh, working on um, debating on, on definitions and concepts or, or, um, or just um, talking about our research um, during workshops. So, so that was the kind of job that I had at, um, at Stanford. Right. And then uh, when I when I moved here to DC, um, and you know right away when I was completing my my dissertation, I, I saw this job ad and I and I thought, to be honest, I didn't know many people here. I had right, my, right. my own network for uh, nuclear policy because I've been involved uh, through my advisor uh, and through sure. my mentor at Stanford. Uh, on the nuclear policy, nuclear security community. Uh, but my network in US-Japan relations what, wasn't that developed. This was 2017 when I moved here. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I saw the, the job uh, ad and it seemed perfect for me. So I applied and I got it. I was shocked, but I was, I was, I felt very lucky. And at Sasakawa Peace Foundation, um, as a fellow for security and foreign affairs, um, I was doing research, but uh, I was also doing everything else. So mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of programming. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing some logistics as well. And that really opened uh, the door for uh, another kind of networking um, and uh, of course the, the, the door of US Japan relations really uh, was uh, wide open and I started uh, really developing and expanding my network uh, here in DC and it's proved so valuable this, this skill. Um, at first I completely agree with uh, what both of you said, actually. It felt a little transactional. It felt a little like, you know, pe people will tell you in DC connections are important. So you think, oh my gosh, I have to have 
um, some family members that is that what in in this organization to get the job is that what you mean but actually that's that's not what it means right networking is um, as you said it's um, taking but also giving and one thing I noticed um, recently is that I'm also enjoying mentoring and mm -hmm. um, talking to more junior people, younger people um, who approach me like I uh, had approached those more senior people years before. And I feel like I can give back, you know, to the to the to the next it's fun, generation. isn't it? It's great. It's the best part of being a senior. <laughs> Yeah, and now I'm sure Paul is feeling that too, because we're about the same age, and uh, it's it's really uh, now that I'm starting to see oh these the younger people are are, are coming to me now like I was doing uh, seven eight years ago, and and this is really great. So it doesn't feel that uh, it, it doesn't feel transactional at all. Actually, it's 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 a really nice. It creates such a nice uh, network. Definitely. And it's it's very helpful. You, I found when I was um, when I was looking for a job after Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Um, when I was looking for a job, I found that the people in your network are very helpful. They're all of them accepted to sit down with me, to brainstorm with me, to uh, to help me in in many ways and. I was so moved because uh, because everyone was very kind and they, they they were very generous with their time and they were sending me job ads. So uh, yeah, I, I think networking is definitely important and it's just, it's long term, as you said, Tom, um, and it's a skill that um, you can be social, but it, it's it's not that is easy to, to to network right away it takes practice i think so it's an acquired skill definitely the good news is like you said is that people love talking about themselves they love sharing about their accomplishments and their pathway so so uh, you know we should share with our viewers not to be shy to reach out and to ask for these information sessions there's a great book i don't remember the author but um it's on Amazon, uh, tw uh, the 20 minute networking session, just gives an agenda. It's really great for a, a, an undergraduate just coming out of school, trying to understand what these networking sessions or what these informational interviews may look like. Just you go in, you get out, you're out in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, don't take any more than that. And if you want to do a follow up, fine, but stay on schedule, have an agenda and, um, and be organized. Um, Wonderful, wonderful. So let's talk a, a little bit about what you're doing now. Can you give us a sense of what your day to day um, responsibilities are and, and what you're, uh, what you're doing within US Japan relations or international education or um, international relations, maybe start with Paul. Yeah, um, and then my my work definitely works more on the global scale. Um, mm -hmm. I do have some Japan focused programs that we work sure. on, but definitely uh, it's quite global. Um, if I was to start on our Japanese programs, um, one of recent program we just did that was done virtually for the first time uh, was the MetLife uh, Women's Leadership Initiative of Tomodachi. Um, okay. This is done through the US Japan Council. Um, and so it brings together uh, 50, around 50 university uh, students from Japan who uh, are being developed as emerging leaders. And so there is a portion that occurs in Japan and then another portion that occurs uh, with the United States. And so uh, we had um, US-based members and professional resources that were able to give trainings, workshops, um, and uh, professional meetings to these um, women leaders uh, from Japan and um, give them not only connections, but also practical uh, advice and feedback in terms of how do you continue to grow in whatever direction you want to go in. Um, but for as a senior director, I would say my day to day has been, um, like I said, more monitoring the grants, making sure mm -hmm. we're reaching completion. I have a team of between 10 to 12 staff okay. um, of programmers that end up uh, more or less uh, doing the program themselves. And I check in with them and, and uh, 
basically create touch points for them over the course of the grant, okay. make sure that the finances are, are uh, going, going well and accordingly. Um, I'm also very internal facing with the rest of the organization. I'm sort of like a mediation point between our programs and then making sure that relevant information is being passed on to the rest of the organization, things that we can publicize um, that we can use for further outreach with other types of initiatives that we're doing. Um, I do definitely still try to stay involved in the programming. So uh, for example, I am currently doing a, a virtual IVLP program for a group of uh, five participants from China who are learning about uh, uh, biodiversity and conservation in the United States. And so we're connecting them to their counterparts here in the US um, in Washington, DC, but a little bit everywhere. And actually, Tom, uh, on Thursday, they'll be meeting with resources from Boston virtually. Uh, Super. So Great. yeah, we, we connect city. them. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And, and we connect them a little bit throughout the United States. Okay. Uh, so that is a bit of, of that day to day. <laughs> How's the Zoom connection from, does it work it's, okay? Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah. Zoom connection is is pretty solid, um, thankfully. That doesn't happen with every single country. Um, right, right. The connection can sometimes falter. Uh, it's more the time difference because there's okay. about a 12 hour time difference right now. So right. we have to do early morning and for the participants it's late at night, um, right. but it changes for each country that we end up working right. with. Fantastic. So Yuri, let's go to you. Um, and as you're speaking, I'd like if there are any attendees that want to drop in, uh, you know, a couple of questions, uh, let us know. We're going to we'll have a hard stop at nine. So there's a couple of questions that I want to get to, but drop them in as Sayuri is speaking. What do you do, Sayuri, on your day to day um, uh, basis? Yeah, sure. So um, I started at Mansfield in July last year, so I'm relatively new, at least compared to, to, to <laughs> Paul, <laughs> who has been in, in his position for, for some time, in his organization for some time. So um, yeah, our foundation has a lot of diff different programs, different exchange programs or like dialogues, fora, um, and many of them are trilateral dialogues, as I was saying in my opening comments. Uh, it's def definitely US, Japan, and something else, like mm -hmm. another country, another region, Southeast Asia, or it can be China, South Korea. And um, they are programs that they are really uh, well structured, well conceptualized, and uh, have what I find very important purposes, um, something that I really think it's special about Mansfield is that we avoid uh, one-off programs. Uh -huh. So we, we favor continuity. Uh, we create um, a network of experts uh, in, in a certain field or category. Um, we, we raise them, we train them, um, and uh, another thing we do is we inform um, lawmakers, for example, I'm responsible for uh, the Capitol Hill Asia Policy Dialogues, mm -hmm. um, and it is my responsibility to um, think of these events, um, what, what the topic could be, what the framing, what the aspects um, that I want to cover uh, on Asia in general, Asian politics, and something that could interest um, Capitol Hill um, staffers. So that's something that's a little bit new for me, but I'm enjoying, again, the networking really helps it's uh, it's virtual so far, but uh, right, right. Uh, they're they are all uh, virtual, uh, remote right now um, on the hill. But it's it's really interesting to uh, to talk to them to see what their what their boss is interested in, and then you know it's my job to to think of um, the the hot topics right now, and right. especially what kind of speaker. Uh, we could introduce to them mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there's there's a lot of thinking um, on a day-to-day -day basis um, but also a lot of busy work um, right trying to coordinate with my teammates uh, the when the where and uh, the how 
Um, so it's, um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm really lucky because everyone is so hardworking at Mansfield. And so it's, it's also like intellectually stimulating. Um, we are a current challenge um, for me is, and I think for everyone is just transitioning from virtual to in-person programs now. So right. now we're, right. we, we're going to, to hold, uh, for example, an in-person uh, workshop on climate change and energy with Chinese, Japanese, and US participants uh, in June in Hawaii. Uh, it's exciting, but also uh, there are some extra uh, hurdles uh, that come with uh, this uncertain period. So, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And for two years, um, the programs at Mansfield have been uh, put on hold, uh, which was uh, difficult. But uh, now we are resuming, so it, it's getting very busy actually this spring. It's an exciting time for, for all of us in international education, even the Bridging Scholars Program. Japan is opening to students and we're moving ahead for a fall departure, probably have around 80 students heading over. So we are very excited um, and hopefully things continue to go well. Um, actually, this, um, can, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Can I add one more thing? Please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, this is um, an example of collaboration. Um, we, yesterday, uh, our new Korean intern started at Mansfield. Um, she comes from some, from Seoul and um, she, 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 she's come here thanks to Paul's organization, uh, to Cultural Vistas. So uh, we're very grateful and um, they, they really do a wonderful job uh, facilitating th this kind of exchanges. And we're also very happy to, to have her uh, start her internship. She will be here with us uh, until July. So uh, it's so helpful and we're very excited. Uh, this, is, this is so true. Uh, international education is such a small world and organizations like the three of ours work together all the time. Um, uh, can you just quickly what, describe the size of your organization? Paul, yours is about how many people and how many international visitors uh, participants do you have per year? Uh, our organization is currently maybe about 60 people. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like I had mentioned uh, earlier where on average we we target 3000 inter, uh, international visitor exchanges uh, as well as american exchanges too mm -hmm. because we'll have some programs that send americans abroad too so yuri how about mansfield mansfield is very small actually we're about 12 or 13 uh, yeah. i would say we have three offices actually we have one here in dc but we have also we also have one in Tokyo and one in Montana, uh, in Montana because um, Senator Mansfield was from Montana. Um, right. And uh, in Montana, we have um, our admin slash uh, mm -hmm. finance team, and um, we have we have the the director of the Tokyo office plus. Uh, uh, their uh, program managers and directors there in Tokyo, and uh, we are, I can't remember how many we are here, <laughs> but in DC, but we are very small. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have, for example, uh, we have a lot of alumni and uh, really big networks um, in through our programs. For example, our uh, Mansfield Fellowship Program, which is our flagship program um, at Mansfield, um, has almost 200 alumni now. Uh, we've been uh, running this program for, for 25 years and we have, um, basically the program is uh, taking every year, taking 10, up to 10 um, government uh, employees, US yes. government employees to Japan for a year um, so that they can also um, sort of work in, in these, uh, in, 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 uh, in the offices of uh, the Japanese government and um, thus bring back all their experience then. And uh, yeah, so we have a lot of alumni, but, alumni, but um, uh, our staff is really, really small. 
the bridging foundation too is small. We have one full-time employee, um, but really the organization is run by, um, we have two uh, consultants who do a lot of the work behind the scenes who I'm very grateful for. Um, Great. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, um, the people here are asking you know, how to get involved if I want to do um, and build a, a future in Japan. Uh, what is the best way to do that? Jet? Something else? What are your thoughts? Paul, you want to jump in? Uh, Jet was a very uh, great way for, for me to, to get more involved with US-Japan relations. And then, like I had mentioned, it was a, a great pathway to, to going into a more global field as well, too. Um, I know that there are people who do um, a variety of different things. So some people have joined uh, various industries as well. Um, I see that there is a question, for example, about doing US-Japan relations when you don't live in Washington, DC or another large yeah. city. Um, I do know that there's Japanese industries a little bit everywhere throughout the United States. And so uh, I do know of people, for example, who uh, work for Toyota um, out in uh, rural areas. Uh, the, the future of work is also changing with the pandemic. We're seeing a lot more remote opportunities. Right. So even if you're not based physically in a large city, um, there are a lot of remote positions starting to become available. And so people who are interested um, but are, are uh, sort of limited by what is in their immediate area now have more opportunities to be able to do that. I know Cultural Vistas, for example, has an extended uh, remote work policy um, that goes at least until November of this year and is most likely going to get you know, extended mm -hmm. at the same time. And so uh, that's something that I've been seeing that's, that's changing uh, as we move into the future, which does open up opportunities for a lot of, a lot of people interested, um, whether it's global relations or US-Japan relations. Mm -hmm. Sayuri, advice for getting involved um, to create a future in Japan. Yeah, so for, first of all, I, I do agree with, with Paul. I think um, the pandemic has uh, brought a lot of bad things, but at the same time, I think this uh, remote work uh, is good. And uh, if you're, even if you're, you're not in a city or you, you, know, you, you can't go to Japan, there are ways to be professionally engaged uh, with, with Japan. In, in many ways. Um, and one thing I, I recommend is learn Japanese, learn Japanese well. I think uh, really learning the language well will, will make you stand out uh, among so many candidates um, for a spot um, for the field. So I, I think it's, it's, it's really, really important that you master uh, the, the language, uh, especially um, if you want to work in Japan or in a Japanese company or a, 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 yeah, a company that has a Japanese work culture, um, I think it's really important to be able to, to hold a conversation in Japanese. So I can't stress this enough. It's, it's really important and it does make a difference. So, um, so study really well. Um, and I also think one advice I can, I can give is to be flexible, to remain flexible and open-minded. I think that's really important. Uh, don't get fixated on a per particular position or a path or um, you know, a, a person or, or an organization. Um, and don't get uh, sad and depressed or angry if you don't get that job. Um, I think I, I've, I've noticed, uh, I'm, I'm sure Paul has too, that um, it's, it's really a journey with a lot of um, challenges uh, on your way um, professionally, but it's really important to, to, to keep your, your mind really open and your options um, open, be, be flexible. For example, I, for example, you know, I, as I mentioned, I'm, I have a research background, uh, but my current position at Mansfield is, um, I can do research on the side, but my main, uh, my main uh, job is basically to, 
to conceptualize programs, to run programs, to, to, to execute them. And that's a very different skill. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much. Uh, and I think what saved me in a way and, and make me find this job is that um, I kept my uh, an open mind. And even though, you know, I had a um, training uh, in research, I had gotten my PhD, I wasn't fixated on academia. I have to be a professor also because um, again, being a trying to be a, a professor here with a with a PhD from a, a different country, it's difficult. Um, so I had to reinvent myself and trying to to think of other options. So yeah, be nimble, be flexible, and open minded with your mind. Don't get fixated on on one path or uh, a, a particular position is good. Well, thank you both uh, so much for tonight. This has been fantastic. Several of the participants have questions related to pathways to uh, finding Japan related jobs. And I'd like to direct them to um, one of our webinars from, uh, I think it was last semester where uh, Kasha Lynch introduced pathways to Japan related careers. So it's on the YouTube site, uh, look it up, it's fascinating. And she goes through um, different pathways and different fields and different sectors that you may be able to connect to Japan, both in Japan and in the United States. So do check that out. It was really nice to meet the both of you. I wish our conversation could continue for longer, but we're going to wrap it up. Paul and Sayuri, thank you so much for your time. It's been great. And I hope to meet you in DC in the coming months, if not um, the see you in the fall. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Tom. Great. Let us know when you're here. I will. Okay, great. great. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good night.